topic I have been asked to talk to you about, about is life during COVID. So what is COVID? Now, COVID is the disease caused by the virus, which we now know as the SARS coronavirus 2. So the SARS coronavirus 2 causes the disease known as COVID-19. Now, this started in the Wuhan city of China in uh, the late half of 2019. It is believed that it originated from the coronavirus. Now, coronaviruses are a group of viruses which typically cause common cold symptoms. So you have stuffy nose, runny nose, a heavy head, and probably a little bit of a cough, which typically are symptoms caused by the coronavirus. But the coronavirus, which we have known for the last about 40 to 50 years, has an ability to change itself, or what we refer in medical term as mutate. The mutation can sometimes lead to very dangerous effects. And the first time this happened was in 2002, when the first SARS outbreak happened in Hong Kong. So this coronavirus, which originated from bats, passed through an intermediary animal called the civet cat, and then developed the ability to infect the lung. As you know, cold typically involves only symptoms of the upper respiratory tract, but the mutated coronavirus was able to infect the lung and cause a pneumonia. So this was the first outbreak of SARS and about 8,000 people the world over were affected and 10% of them died. Subsequently, in 2012, there was a second mutation, what was referred to as MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which again was a coronavirus originating in bats, changed itself through camels, it affected men, which typically happened in Saudi Arabia. And then it caused pneumonia. And this was much more fatal. Almost 35% of people who developed the infection died. But fortunately, about 2,000 people only have been infected so far. Very rarely, we still see the cases. Now, this outbreak is the third mutation of the coronavirus, which started probably sometime in November 2019 in a market in Wuhan city of Hubei province of China. It is again believed to have started in bats, then moved through an animal known as pangolin and subsequently affected man again with the same ability to infect the lungs causing pneumonia. Fortunately, the mortality or the number of people who die is less than 1%. Though as you grow older, the people can have poorer outcomes and more number of people can die if the age is over 60 years or if they have underlying high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, these can increase the risk of dying. What are the symptoms of this COVID-19? Because it is a virus which enters through the nose and can affect the upper respiratory tract and the lung, typical symptoms involve a fever, cough, a runny nose or sneezing, this can progressively also involve the other system where you may develop severe body pain, headaches, chills, shivering, diarrhea, loss of appetite, and typically loss of taste and smell has also been seen with COVID-19. So in this time of the pandemic, if any one of you develop a loss of smell and a loss of taste lasting more than a day or two, you need to keep in mind the possibility of COVID even if you don't have fever, cough, or other symptoms. How does this virus spread? Because it's a respiratory virus, it spreads from the droplets. When I cough, when I sneeze, when I sing, when I talk loudly, there are droplets which come out of my mouth. These droplets, the virus is attached to these droplets and then can spread to the person who's near you, which means generally, it doesn't spread more than three to four feet from a person. Unless I very violently sneeze when the sneeze droplets may go about 10 to 15 feet for all practical purposes, their spread is only for about three to five feet at the most. So if you are a couple of meters away from somebody who has symptoms, it is unlikely that you will get the infection. Majority of, majority of spread is only from direct one person to another the chances that it may spread through inanimate objects. For example, if I have the infection, I cough into my hands and the contaminated hands, I touch a doorknob, 
I touch a telephone, I touch a table, and if somebody else touches the same table or doorknob or telephone and takes a hand near his face, he may also get the infection. But this mode of spread is less likely. It is mainly directly from one person to another through close proximity. That is how it spreads. The good news is 80% of infections are mild to moderate and which does not even require hospitalization. Only 20% may require hospitalization. The reason I'm saying this is do not panic if you have suspicion or if you have been diagnosed to have COVID. There is an 80% chance that you may never need to even go to the hospital. 20% may require hospitalization. 5% may end up in the ICU requiring supportive oxygen help or even mechanical ventilation. So the predominant chance that you will come through without any issue is there and please be reassured. The mortality rate or the number of people who die is actually less than 1%. Now this is still significantly higher than the flu, but because this infection is highly contagious compared to the flu, this is twice or three times as infectious as the flu. And the mortality is also for flu, it is 0.04%. For this, it may be 10 times higher. So keeping in mind the increased infectivity and the possibility that the risk of death is also higher, the number of people who may die is actually high in our population. And this also is made worse by the fact if you are older than 60 and if you have underlying heart lung disease, the complications are higher. How do you treat this infection? Now, unfortunately, in spite of several studies being done for various agents, the specific agents which may be helpful in treating this condition is still very, very small. There is one antiviral known as remdesivir, which seems to give some kind of help in minimizing the duration of illness. We have used other immunomodulating agents like steroids. We use certain anti-clotting drugs to prevent the small clots which may happen in the lungs, which may make the breathing worse and the oxygen lower. We have also used certain other drugs. One is called tocilizumab, which modifies the immune response. In fact, during COVID, it is believed rather than the direct action of the virus on the lung and causing damage, the action is mediated through certain chemicals called cytokines, which for which you need to give anti-cytokine agents to minimize the damage. And similarly, steroids also suppress the inflammation. And also sometimes you get small clot formation in the lungs because of the virus infection, which may also impair the oxygen transfer. So we give anti-clotting agents also. And by using a combination of these, we generally uh, do help the person recover faster. Body pain, chills, headache, fever, loss of taste, smell, you need to consider the possibility of COVID and isolate yourself. Please remember, because you start becoming infectious even two days before your symptoms start, you need to ensure that you isolate yourself. So the next question is, when should I do the test? I think if your symptoms persist for 24 to 48 hours, I think you need to consider to do the test because sometimes you may just have a little sore throat for a few hours and then it may disappear. So I wouldn't advise everybody rushing in for a test as soon as you develop symptoms, but make sure that you isolate yourself in a room, stay away from others. And if the symptoms persist, you need to test yourself. The next question is, how can I prevent myself or protect myself from getting the disease? Two simple things. One, always stay six to three to six feet away from anybody else. And two, always wear a mask. Whenever you step out of the house, the mask should be on your face. It should cover your nose, it should cover your mouth and completely close this. The mask should not be on your chin. The mask should not be around only your mouth. It should not be on your throat. It should be properly placed. So as soon as you step out of the house, make sure that you keep a mask on. So if you do these two things, I think that is more than enough. The chances of touching something and then getting contaminated is very small. But if you wash your hands or use alcohol sanitizer periodically, even by mistake, if you take your hands near your face, you are still not going to infect yourself. The next question is, is there any specific food or diet I need to follow? No, I don't think there is any connection with food and this illness. So whether it is vegetarian, non-vegetarian, whether it is a food you're ordering from outside or cooked, it doesn't matter. If you're ordering food from outside, 
there is a small possibility that the package may be contaminated. So after touching the package, wash your hands well. That is enough. You don't need to sit and you know, sanitize your vegetables. You don't need to sanitize your boxes, your newspaper, your milk packets. Not at all needed. The small possibility that that may transfer infection is ruled out if after touching that, you wash your hands before you move on to do other work. The next question, what about the role of vitamins? People are consuming zinc and vitamin C in industrial doses. Is that indicated? No. Even though we are recommending zinc and vitamin C, probably with the idea that some respiratory viruses have been shown to be shown to respond to these, there is no medical data available to say that COVID-19 specifically does well if you take too much of vitamin C or zinc. So don't poison and overdose yourself. If your diet has not been great, taking some vitamins is perfectly acceptable, but it doesn't make wonders. The other question, what about the Ayurvedic preparations, the homeopathic preparations, the Kabasara Kudinir, the Arsenika album? As of now, there is no medical evidence to say that any of them works. These are all agents which are believed to help probably improve our immunity, but nothing specifically for COVID. What should you do if a worker in one of your factories or organizations develops a fever? If suppose he comes in the morning and then develops a fever and leaves in the afternoon, as I told you, he has become infectious even two days before the onset of symptoms, which means that you need to find out who are the people who have come into contact with him in close proximity. If all the employees in your concern are wearing masks, then there is no need to worry at all. If there is somebody who has been you or somebody else who has come into contact with an infected person without a mask in close proximity for at least 15 minutes, that puts you under high risk. Similarly, any household member of a positive COVID case is a high risk contact. So these are people who should be quarantined immediately for the next 14 days. And if they develop symptoms, you need to test or you can test them after seven to 10 days the incubation period or the time between when a person is exposed and the, when the person develops symptoms is anywhere from two to 14 days, but an average of about four to five days, which is what you need to watch out for. Is there any vaccine available? No studies are on for a vaccine, but realistically speaking, it looks like it may take at least 12 to 18 months before a vaccine is available. So till then, all of us have to accept that the virus is going to be with us and take the necessary precautions. What about if I'm a diabetic, if I have underlying disease, how do I handle it? People who are vulnerable and who can end up with more complications should ensure that they protect themselves. So which means if you have elderly people living in their house, take extra precautions to make sure that they are physically distanced. They make sure that they do not go out as much as possible. And even if they go out, they don't go to functions or any crowded session. So please remember, this is not the time for making merry and having functions and celebrating. Any gathering should be as limited as possible. Try to postpone everything because it is mainly in indoor gatherings that the infection spreads. So please, please, please. I know as a community, as Indians, we are used to celebrating. We are used to meeting together. We are used to, you know, meeting and talking. We need to have some restraint, especially with crowds and we need to postpone all functions as much as possible. As of now, it seems very unlikely that a person can become reinfected, even though the antibodies generally produced are not very protective in most people. We believe that once you have recovered from the infection, it is very unlikely that you will have the infection again, but we have to wait and see. Anything which increases the proximity of people, any crowds, any travel definitely increases the risk. So you need to stay physically distanced. If you need to travel, say, for example, to Bangalore, it is safer to go by car than by flight because the more you're going to come across people in close proximity, the risk is increased. You need to ensure that masks probably are very effective. So always wear a mask. We have a tendency. We are not used to the culture of masks. So when we go near somebody, we pull the mask down and start talking. We need to have discipline that especially when you're with somebody who's not a family member living in the same household, you need to have a mask covering your face and nose.
Right. This is very peculiar to this virus, even though there are certain other respiratory viruses which can cause loss of smell. It is believed that because the virus affects the respiratory lining inside, the smell receptors are found in the inside of the nose. So it is believed that there is some inflammation which causes block of smell. In general, most often the smell uh, sensation returns in two weeks time. But there are some people who may have a very prolonged loss of sense uh, of smell, which we need to look into other ways to get it uh, to recover. First, most people don't need to be in hospital. Home isolation is good enough. Only people who are borderline, whose oxygen requirement increases because their saturation drops less than 94%, probably need to be in hospital or elderly people who may deteriorate rapidly. One more word, there's don't go hoarding and buying the oxygen saturations and keep checking it for all healthy people. The oxygen saturation is only for people who are unwell. Normal you and me don't need to monitor it every day. That is not something which should make you feel either happy or worried. It's only when you develop symptoms, then you need to keep monitoring it at least two to three times a day and make sure that the level is over 94%. Once you get admitted to hospital, generally... Earlier, we used to repeat the test after 14 days to see whether we have cleared the infection. Nowadays, that is no longer recommended because sometimes the genetic material of the virus, which is detected by the test, may remain positive for three, four, five weeks. So we don't routinely repeat it. If you are free of symptoms for at least three days and have at least completed 10 days of symptoms, then we can send you home. So we are now coming down because it has been shown that after eight to 10 days, the chances that you're going to be infectious to others is very small. As I told you, the infectivity is generally about 10 days. So if you are asymptomatic for three days and have completed at least 10 days of symptoms, you can go home. The government advises another seven days of quarantine. So totally maximum 17 days is all that is required, not more than that. I think that is a very, very practical point you've raised. I also see a hell of a lot of people who are just so paranoid about this infection. That is why I'm reiterating that 80% of people recover even without bothering to go to the doctors. And I would say a significant number of us are maybe even asymptomatic. So please understand COVID-19 is not the death sentence. It is something which causes mortality in less than 1% of cases and that two people with underlying possible or underlying health problems. So you need to, one, stop loading yourself with, un, uh, you know, what shall I say, unnecessary information and statistics which are available on the television and on the social media. Please stop getting fixated on social media. Put your minds on positive things. I'm a very strong believer that the more positive thoughts you have, the more strong your immune system is. So please don't keep on reading news about COVID. Please don't start imagining because I feel I see patients who are having no other symptoms, but they come to me with breathlessness. It is all questioned because they are very, very worried. So this is something you need to address, especially in a situation where one, you are isolating yourself from the rest of the world away from your usual way of life. And two, in a situation where there is so much of uncertainty Uncertainty is something which we cannot handle. In fact, it is said that maturity is defined by our ability to handle uncertainty. And unfortunately, most of us are not mature enough to handle the current prevailing situation of uncertainty. So we need to seek help. Please don't hesitate to go to your doctor. If you are having paranoid ideas, if your behavior borders on irrational thoughts and ideas, please seek help. You may require tranquilizers. You may require antidepressants. I come across a lot of people who are physically sound, but mentally are a wreck. So I think this is something which we should not, uh, you know, uh, ignore. Make sure that you don't overload yourself with information and, uh, you know, spoil your thought process. Yes, you can cohort people. So if you are in your family, there are three people who are affected. The three of them can stay together. Not a problem. The first symptom can be anything from sneezing to coughing to body pains to headaches to chills to loss of appetite and loss of smell and taste to diarrhea, anything. So, you know, I don't want you imagining a lot of things, but if you consistently feel unwell for 24 to 48 hours, I think you need to seek medical help. At least speak to your doctor. Next 
No, there is a lot of wishful thinking. You gargle with salt water, use hot water, you steam your nose and throat. There is no medical evidence to say any of this helps. Yes, the virus is going to be around for several months or even a couple of years. I'm sorry to say, but unfortunately, we have to accept reality. Yes, the virus is going to be around even if in another couple of months, Tamil Nadu gets rid of it. There is likely to be a second wave or a third wave. So we need to prepare ourselves for it. Second, mm -hmm. is it better to get the infection and get away with it? If you are young, I think that is an option. But if you're over the age of 60 or with underlying possibilities, the risk goes up. For example, the risk of dying is about 15% in people over the age of 80. So I think we have to still be careful. I wouldn't be cavalier and, you know, just hope that I will get the disease and recover. I think we need to be careful. So if exactly. you are close to somebody who is infected and he coughs or sneezes, you get it. The chances coming through, somebody asked about currency notes, currency notes or vegetables or newspapers or anything uh, is very, very small. As long as you keep your hands clean and avoid taking your hands near the face, especially in public uh, places, you'll be safe. Aerosols are predominantly formed in the hospital environment where certain aerosol generating procedures can be done. In normal uh, you know, community, the chances of aerosol formation, even though theoretically can happen, is very, very small. If you all of us wear masks, the masks, remember, is more useful in preventing the virus getting away from you to somebody else rather than protecting you. So if everybody wears a mask, we not only protect others, even if they are asymptomatic, we also stay protected. So that should be enough for the public. Yes, I didn't want to comment on that, but you have asked for it. The antibody tests show that the body has, who has been infected produces antibodies which take about a couple of weeks to form and may be found in the, bed, in the blood. Uh, so far, antibody tests are available. They are not foolproof. They have some limitations. It takes, as I told you, it is not for people who are having symptoms. It is only to check whether in the past we have been exposed and have developed antibodies. Yes, there is a role. But my clinic also does antibody tests, uh, you know, for people in such a situation. But you have to understand that the antibodies in some people may not be formed even after an infection. And similarly, it may levels may drop soon. And sometimes it can be very rarely false positive also. So there are a lot of limitations. But if you understand this and get the test done, perfectly fine. And if you have antibodies, I think you are one of the lucky ones. HCQS is the drug. HCQS is the drug which we use. It's a modification of the anti-malaria drug. This was believed initially in the first three months of the outbreak to have some antiviral effects. It was used for treatment, but subsequently studies have shown that it doesn't help in the treatment. And now the World Health Organization has in fact blocked treatment of the condition with HCQS. The ICMR recommends HCQS in prevention. That is, if you're living in the same household as somebody who's COVID positive, or if you're a doctor or a nurse looking after COVID patients, you take the HCQS once a week to prevent infection. It is only in these two situations. I reiterate, only healthcare workers who are treating patients and a household member of a COVID positive patient, preventive HCQS is being advised by the ICMR. We don't have enough scientific evidence, but the ICMR feels that there is probably a role. We need to wait and see for more information. It is not for the general public. No, even though the virus has mutated 25 to 30 times, uh, as of now, the mutations are still very mild and there is no change in the virulence as far as medical evidence goes. And uh, even though people rapidly deteriorate, if you question them, you will understand that they have been feeling unwell for a few days before it started. So even people who say, I started feeling unwell in the morning and now become breathless, it is unlikely they would have had some symptoms which they probably have ignored. See, plasma therapy has been around since 1918, during the Spanish flu, about 102 years ago, it came into vogue. We have used it for several conditions, including H1N1, uh, Ebola, Z. As of now, it is still in patients who are just about to deteriorate, but not too far gone. Uh, studies are on. I'm not yet very confident that it will help. But 
as I said, it is still too early days. The, the results have not been uh, fantastic, but we have to wait and see. Absolutely simple running water is more than enough. This is a very easily destroyed virus. So you need to wash it with water more than enough. And after that, you wash your hands. I don't think you need to worry about, uh, you know, getting COVID through vegetables. No way. Now, I think this is something which you again raised a very nice point. I think the press should be more responsible. We have to accept that the cases will increase. We are going through a phenomenon where if whatever happens today is what actually happened two weeks ago. So the cases will keep rising for another two to four weeks. Definitely, it is not something you need to panic about. We have to accept it and we need to change our ways so that we stay protected. That is the only lesson you need to learn. I can see three or four questions here quickly. I will run through one. Does pranayam help? Um, pranayam is good for the general physical and mental well-being. It reduces stress, probably improves immunity. So it is helpful, but not specifically for uh, COVID. Two, if I have sinus problems, if I have this problem, that problem, none of them are risky. Please remember only people with uncontrolled diabetes, people with underlying heart and lung disease, people over the age of 65, 70, they are at a higher risk. Most of us are perfectly well, so stop worrying about it. What type of mask do you wear? I think only healthcare workers need to wear an N95. The common public needs to wear only a two or a three layered washable cotton mask. If you are having symptoms, then the blue or the green colored surgical mask is advisable. But otherwise, simple cotton mask is what is recommended for most people. Very real, very real. So the simple common sense answer would be anybody coming from outside the house on whom you have no you know, control over their discipline and wearing of masks, please ensure that you stay physically distanced from them. When they come every day morning and go, whenever they are in the house, don't go near six feet of them. And if possible, ask them to wear a mask when they work in the house. Other than this, I think you should be safe. Pets don't transmit the infection. So don't worry about pets. Stage, I think this is immaterial. You know, I don't understand the situation towards community transmission. When you're having 1,500 cases a day, uh, to me, it's only common sense that it is all around us and all within us and with us. So I think we should stop bothering about this community transmission and, you know, what stage we are in. There are some studies which say that uh, people with blood group A are at an increased risk of developing uh, complications. People who are bald are at an increased risk of developing complications. I have both of these factors. So, but these are all anecdotal studies which I wouldn't lose sleep over. Just perfectly fine as long as you are going to be away from crowds. So if you're going at 5.30 in the morning and going in an area where there is no crowd, If you are absolutely sure that you did not get out of the house and did not meet anybody, I don't think I would worry about COVID. So stop, stop worrying. As long as you are disciplined in ensuring that you physically distance with anybody else and wear a mask, there is nothing to worry. Positive. I, I think a one gene of it is non-specific, which may be a, which may be a not specific for COVID. But if two genes are positive, the test should be taken as positive. Four or five points I would like to say. One, we need to first stay calm. Unless your mind is calm, we will not do things rationally. It has been very clearly shown through medical studies that when your mind is agitated, when your mind is anxious, when you are under duress, you will not act rationally and sensibly. So the first thing is to consciously calm yourself down. This is a pandemic. This too shall pass. I think this is something which we have to go through. Two, we have the COVID within us, in the, in the midst of us. So we have to accept and take the necessary precautions. You know, somebody said that uh, uh, we need to stay with the hopeful optimism. But as you know that hope is not a strategy. We need to have a strategy. So what should we do? One, ensure. Now, Jains are very hospitable people. They love joint families. You have, you know, good fun festivals, Punjabis, all that, you know. So these, as, as a group, you are very, very used to 
socializing. I think for some time, we need to put a stop to that. We need to ensure physical distancing. We need to ensure that we are disciplined enough to wear masks. If all the people living in the house are disciplined, even if they go out, they are not going to bring it back. Even if one person is indisciplined, then the person will bring it back and spread it to everybody else because in the household, you're not going to be masked. So please remember that discipline is very, very important, whether it is your neighbor, whether it is your colleague, whether it is your, you know, your coworker, every person is likely to be COVID-19 positive and you need to take precautions to protect yourself. This is the only mantra you need to have in mind. Whoever it is, is likely to be COVID-19 positive outside your door. When you step out of your threshold, that is where your risk is. So stay careful. Third, you need to ensure that if you are unwell, even if whether you think COVID or not, isolate yourself. And within a day or two, if the symptoms don't settle, seek medical help to assess, to see whether a test is necessary so that you can be more careful on how you're going to face it. In particular, eat whatever you like to eat, continue whatever you're doing. I don't think there is anything specific of food to got to do with this. So stay happy, stay well-fed and comfortable. Nothing particular for this. Thing which I want to, you know, before I leave, tell you is that we all have what is called a self-positivity bias. We think that the virus cannot hit us. You know, we are somehow immune. We like to always think, even if we have a problem, that it is not likely to be the virus. So what we need to do is be a little practical and ensure that we have in place a system. If tomorrow, if I or my wife or my son or my father comes down with the infection, what am I going to do? How am I going to face it? You need to have in place somebody who can, you know, who can be your carer, somebody who can get medicines for you. If, for example, there is a quarantine put in your house, how are you going to get, you know, cook food or order food? How are you going to ensure that medicines are needed? You're going to get it. So please be sensible that you have, you think about these things so that if a help is needed, it could be through the Apollo home care system, whatever, but make sure that you subscribe, make sure that you put in place a system so that you don't panic in case there is a problem, because not only do you have to face the infection, the question of how you're going to face the whole problem you know, how you're going to run the family is what is more important. So this is something which I want you to all think about and put in place something. If there is a problem, you can access help. Thank you so much, doctor. I think the final five summary points which you gave us in terms of right from being calm, uh, hope is not a strategy. We have to get onto the task very strategically. Facial masks, very important part of the assignment to be having it whenever we are outside. When we are unwell, let's isolate ourselves. And the bias of being self-positive was an amazing point. Uh, but let's be aware. And I think one thing which comes very important out of is keep your hands to yourself. Please don't take your hands towards your face. Wash your hands before you take it to your face. I think it adds up over there. Thank you so much, doctor. Thanks, Raj. Thank you so much. Thank you.